repeated today that you think um, the FOMC should be doing more to provide stimulus. Um, and I think this is a view that a lot of people would agree with, but they, a lot of people also think that the Fed doesn't have a lot of options left to do this. Um, you know, first of all, are you still in favor of lowering, lowering the unemployment rate threshold to 5.5? And would you support any other policy options? So I I, I am still in favor of that, but I view that uh, overarching, that proposal is being subsumed in what I said today. Mm -hmm. In the sense that I think if you stand ready to do whatever it takes to bring the economy back to maximum employment as fast as possible while keeping inflation close to, to uh, 2 percent while maybe temporarily above, that's subsumed I think in uh, my proposal to have an unemployment rate threshold of 5.5 of percent because that ought, the, the theme of doing whatever it takes would automatically mean you're going to be keeping interest rates low, extraordinarily low, even as unemployment comes back down to, to five and a half percent. So as long as inflation is staying, staying uh, close to target. So I am still in favor of that, but I, I view that as being subsumed into the, I would say the more comprehensive approach to forward guidance in some sense that I, 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 I described in my speech today. I mean, how would you, how would you see that as being reflected in a, in, a, in a statement? I mean, it's very clear how you could put 5.5% in a statement. We already have 6.5% in the statement. Um, does the Fed need to be more precise? Can you? Than what I was today? I, uh, Chairman Volcker didn't find that to be true. I think it's uh, the, the key is to, I think enunciating the goal of monetary policy, uh, what we're doing in the medium term, uh, as clearly as I did today, but then the next step is always making sure that you're following, living up to that. Um, and the, the key is to be providing enough stimulus on an ongoing basis that your medium term outlook is closely aligned to your longer term objectives. That's essentially what I called for today is we have established longer term objectives of 2% um, inflation and um, maximum employment while following a balanced approach to both, which would allow for some uh, appropriate deviations on one to deal with the, the other. Um, that's our long-run goals. The committee has all agreed to that. The issue is to, to be taking sufficient action so our medium-term outlook is always aligned with those long-run goals. I think, I don't think, I think that if we don't do that, then the relevance of those long-run goals, the credibility of those long-run goals for our policy decisions is being eroded. I think if those, those, those goals remain, are, are clearly uh, uh, shaping our medium term decision making, um, I think that by itself is a really important form of stimulus for, for, for the economy. So tell me what that means, what setting out those long term goals mean in terms of quantitative easing. I kind of dodged that question at the lunch. Why? Uh, want you to, want you to, I mean, do you want increase So I think that that question, which, you know, I understand why you're asking it. It gets a lot of attention, <laughs> obviously. Um, I think the way to answer that is really in, ha it's very hard to answer that question without having a better sense of what the strategy for the, the committee is. So um, I think if you, right now, so to, to, to try to be clear about what I mean here. There's a lot of discussion about, is the Fed going to keep buying at 85? Is it going to cut back to 75 or 70? You know, all these, the, these numbers get thrown around. The distinction in economic terms of these policy decisions is very tiny. Why does it have so much content? Why are people so interested in it? It's because it's perceived as having signal value. Uh, of, uh, it's communicating something about what the Fed is going to do over the longer haul. Not just at this decision point, but at all the decision points down the road. If we have a um, clear communication of a goal-based monetary policy, um, of the kind I described today in my speech, that we start to ameliorate and mitigate those, those levels of uncertainty. I don't think that what I said today says something specifically about tapering. It says something about the level of accommodation. Um, you, you could imagine, the, the Fed has many tools. You could imagine a world where the uh, situation where the Fed might cut back on the use of one tool and start to use more of another and still have the same level of accommodation. The problem with the, the, the level of the flow purchases is not the big deficiency right now in our statement. The big deficiency is there is a clear gap between our medium term outlook and our longer run objectives. 
And that means people have to guess <laughs> about what we're going to be doing at every meeting down the road. And that uncertainty is, means that uh, markets are more volatile because they're, every scrap of information influences them. And it means interest rates are higher, which is uh, undercutting, the ineffective, uh, undercutting the effectiveness of what we're trying to do. And that's one of the reasons why you support a lower unemployment rate threshold. It is, but again, I would say that the lower unemployment rate threshold is just merely a uh, particular example of, um, of what I, I articulated today in terms of my, uh, my speech. Mm -hmm. it, Go, going to more particular examples, um, would, are you still in favor of the 7% benchmark for uh, around when the Fed would end QE? We, we have unemployment already at 7.3, and you know there's been some noise in the data with the participation rate. So in June, I talked about this a little bit. I, I said that, um, you know, that would be a, a nice, I, I, I thought about 7% as a threshold at that point. Um, again, I think that, but I, as I indicated in my speech today, unemployment is not the only marker in the world for the health of the labor market. And you want to be, I think the benefit of using thresholds, as we've done, is it does provide some quantitative guidance, but at the same time, it's providing more of a holistic view of, the, of, of labor market performance. Um, but I, I, again, I'll return to what I was saying today. I think a critical question for us as the committee is, as long as our inflation outlook remains as subdued as it is for as long as it does, um, that represents a lost opportunity to provide more stimulus to the, to the labor market. And why aren't we doing that? You know, the cost of providing stimulus to the labor market is inflation, but inflation is subdued. So there's got to be a way, we should be doing more on, on, on employment because we have that room in, in terms of inflation. And specifically what you would want the Fed to do more on employment in terms of? I, I think you can't answer it without having the first step is to be clear and coherent about what the strategy, what your goals, meet, what your goals are in making policy, because without that, <laughs> every move you make is just going to be subject to this ongoing guesswork about what we, what, what, what we actually have in mind. So I, I, I am loath to be specific about these, these questions simply because I think we've set ourselves up in a, a very uh, awkward position where every action, no matter how minute the economic consequence of that action, and every communication about that action, no matter how minute that communication might be, is having very undue consequences on people's beliefs about the course of future policy. We have to get that nailed down first through clear uh, description of what our goals are in making policy. And then I think it'll become easier and clearer how to make decisions on an ongoing basis of, of but uh, about what those what the choice of tools will be. So is it misguided this focus on on whether the Fed will taper? Oh know? yeah, absolutely. But I understand what it's the misguided. But misguided seems, seems like I'm placing the blame on the wrong wrong group. The focus is a natural consequence is the fact that we have not provided clarity about the future course of policy. We have not we have not said what we'll do with interest rates once unemployment falls below six and a half percent. It sounds like uh, that it'll be open, these open the potential for the fact that, okay, six and a half is good enough. We'll start raising rates at that point. That's totally consistent with our with our uh, current po um, uh, forward guidance. The having a having a more goals oriented approach to monetary policy, the kind I described today, would would take that off the table. You're not at full employment at that point. Uh, as long you know, as long as inflation is is uh, is uh, as subdued as it is. So I think that um, it is a misguided focus in the, the, because in the sense the economic consequences of this decision is, is so minute. But it, the reason there's so much focus on it is a, is a problem of the Federal Market Committee's own making because we have not been sufficiently clear about what we're going to do down the road. I'm hoping this is a, a, a question about framework and not the specifics, but um, you know, would you be in favor of tying um, the uh, the program of QE, like when it tapers and when it ends, to a specific to specific economic benchmarks? You know, Governor Stein today talked about potentially um, uh, 
you know, saying something like a 10 basis point decline in the unemployment rate would lead to like an X amount of um, uh, bonds that would be purchased less. Yeah, I haven't had a chance to read Governor Stein's speech yet, so I, I shouldn't comment on his proposal at this point um, because I have been busy this morning. And I'm looking forward to having the opportunity to read it, but I haven't, haven't had a chance to read his speech yet. Um, in, in general specificity, in terms of uh, these kinds of, uh, kinds of economic conditionality is, is good. I think that we, you know, the, one of the challenges for us throughout this has been that uh, the view of the labor market has to be more holistic than this one metric. Um, again, I think that I, I think the interpretation of what this what such an announcement would may be in the absence of some kind of broader communication of what our goals are or how we're making policy over the longer haul, um, I worry about how people are going to take that, right? So every action you take, whether it be tying unemployment, uh, purchases to some kind of measure of, of success in the labor market, more specific measure of success in the labor market, even that announcement, who knows how markets are going to interpret it right now because they don't know how we're going to be making decisions on an ongoing basis. We have to, be, we have to provide that context or we're going to be confronting this kind of, um, we do this small move and then we have a big move, a big response in markets, so we'll do this other small move and then there's another big response in markets. The only way to, to get on top of that, I think, is to, to, to provide the kind of clarity of goals uh, that, that uh, following the kind of goal oriented policy that I, I described today. So if, as I think you said, that adding uh, monetary stimulus doesn't necessarily mean buying more than $85 billion a month, um, what else could it mean? What else should it mean? There's a number of tools still at the, the FOMC's uh, disposal. Um, you know, I want to. I'll, I'll try to focus on. Uh, uh, we have very inventive staff, and they're always thinking about these things. So I, I'll leave that that part. There is an openness on that, but I'll mention one that has been uh, been talked about before, which is the interest in excess reserves remains at 25 basis points. Um, you know, again, in terms of the direct economic effect of lowering it, I think would be small, but. I think, in terms of the symbolism, the communication aspect of that action, could be more could be uh, relatively powerful. That now we're making this, ch ch we've left this variable alone for five years. Now we're going to change it. So I think that I, I, certainly part of the whatever it takes description of strategy I, I described today would involve, I think, lowering interest on excess reserves. Another thing that you mentioned today was, you know, the Fed should be willing to do whatever it takes, even if asset prices reaches, you know, what you said, an unusually high level. There's been a lot of concern about um, some bubbles out there, especially in, you know, the riskier parts of the credit markets. Um, you know, so should these concerns of, of financial stability not be a consideration of the Fed's cost-benefit analysis of providing more stimulus? Great question, and the answer is yes and no. <laughs> so let me let me be clear about what I mean. The Fed has been given a dual mandate, which is to to uh, is price stability and promoting maximum employment, promoting price stability and maximum employment. Those are those two objectives. Um, there is no mention of financial stability in there. Um, in 2010, Congress passed the Dodd Frank Act. This was supposed to be uh, one of the, I think the most comprehensive piece of uh, legislation dealing with the financial sector in 75 years. Um, I've searched through the Dodd-Frank Act, more, more correctly my computer has searched through the Dodd-Frank Act for uh, mentions of monetary policy. There are two. Non, neither of those have anything to do with, with financial stability. Uh, I think it's clear in the Dodd-Frank Act that Congress intended um, uh, the oversight of financial stability to be the, the preserve of the financial oversight uh, Stability Oversight Council. Um, so I, I do not think financial stability intrinsically should be a goal of monetary policy because it's not, it is not statutorily a goal of monetary policy, beyond which, more ec economically, it's sort of hard to know, you know if, if the crisis is a upon, you, uh, uh, upon you, you want to lower rates. If it's far enough away, you want to raise rates. I, I think it's very challenging to sort through exactly what you would do in, the, in those circumstances. I do think that um, 
we, we should rely on many sources of information to inform our outlooks for prices and employment. Um, you know, I met with people today in Houghton. That helped provide some information about my, uh, price, about my outlook for prices and employment. People can look at various corners of the bond market. Maybe it helps them. But that's the way it should be informing us, is through our outlook for prices and employment. And that will then feed back to what we want to do with, with rates. I do not think financial stability should be an intrinsic um, part of what we're doing. That is, a goal unto itself. Of, for, for monetary policy. So if, you know, let's say there is um, an asset bubble in some of the riskier parts of the credit market, um, and, uh, you know, that didn't affect the outlook for consumer prices or for employment, then you would be in favor of not letting that affect the Fed's monetary policy decision. That is correct. Uh, now, with that said, the Fed has many other functions, and certainly those kinds of observations might uh, specifically talk about supervision and regulation, for example. Mm -hmm. I could certainly imagine that those observations about what's going on in, in bond markets and how that interacts with banks and, and, and uh, other financial institutions, that could easily play a role in supervisory and regulatory decision making. But in terms of st the monetary policy decision making, no, I would say no to that. The, the, you just said that concern about asset bubbles should not? Except insofar as it informs our outlook for prices and employment. Yeah, it should. That's the only, because the, on, the only goal, the only variables we're charged with trying to, to keep on target, as it were, are prices and employment. I can certainly see how one would want to use observation of asset prices to try to inform one's outlook for those variables. But beyond that, so Aki posed a counterfactual whereby they, the, the elevated asset prices were not influencing one's outlook for prices and employment. Um, would they somehow then uh, affect the course, should they affect the course of monetary policy? My answer is no, because they're not affecting my outlook. But is that really a possibility? I mean, wouldn't they necessarily? No, I think that, uh, that um, um, I'll give an, an example of right now, uh, land prices in uh, the middle portion of the country, agricultural land prices are have risen considerably. I don't ever use the word bubble, mm -hmm. but certainly it raises the possibility they might fall. <laughs> and, but um, the, this is a, um, there's, without getting into too much technicalities, I, I think that this, the effect of this on the overall national economy, such a decline in land prices, uh, even a relatively large one, would be relatively small in the whole national economy. So no, that would be an example where it would not affect our outlook for prices and employment. I'd like to ask you about uh, communications, which obviously you're very interested in, but I specifically want to ask the, the markets uh, expected a taper. They did not get one. Is this a case of them mishearing Fed officials, or did the Fed miscommunicate, or was it what? What is your assessment? And was it was it the right was it a was it a good thing or a bad thing? So there's the narrow and the specific, or the general, I think, in the way to answer that. Um, it's the, you know, the narrow is, I, I mean, I think that uh, what the committee chose to do in September was fully consistent with everything that had been communicated uh, uh, in terms of the outlook that, that, uh, that what the chairman said in June about the future course of policy. Um, I think the more interesting question is, and this is what I was trying to answer earlier is, why did they care? Why did the markets care so much about this? Because it's a relatively small element of monetary policy. I mean, if you, it's, uh, you know, talk, this change in the flow of purchases, um, it should not be expected to have much of an impact on long-term yields of any kind. And uh, so why do the markets care so much? Why do market participants care so much? And that's because they're trying to read into that move what we're gonna be doing down the road. And that's what the true uncertainty is about, that we have not communicated effectively about, about what we're going to be doing down the road. So I, uh, you know, why do they, the, the issue is why do they care? And the, the answer to that is because we have not provided a sufficiently comprehensive approach to, to uh, forward guidance. I mean, my last question. Um, <laughs> you've been saying that the labor market recovery has been too slow. Um, what would be a fast enough rate of job growth well, I think the, the way to read that off is um, um, that it, 
you know, as long as you're keeping infl if inflation outlook is the way I read that off is largely governed actually by the inflation outlook. Mm -hmm. um, that that that's if the inflation outlook is, remains as as muted as it is, um, then I I feel safe in saying it's too slow. If it starts to get closer to two percent, then we can start to have a conversation. How do we weigh that off versus not? Um, and uh, you know, I. At this stage, I haven't really thought that through. I, I, I guess last year I expressed a willingness to see the inflation go 25 basis points above a target. The committee has expressed a willingness to see it go 50 basis points above target, at least while unemployment's above six and a half. Um, you know, but those are, th when the monetary policy right now is sort of uh, uninteresting. It's in the sense that it's easy to know what to do. The outlook calls for more stimulus. It's when you have a tension between inflation and unemployment um, the, two, the two mandates becomes more challenging. Um, I don't foresee that happening <laughs> anytime in the near future, though. Thank you. Thanks. Great questions. Thank you very much.